Volvo Rescue Transmission Rebuild. And based on my appearance, it will not surprise you when I say it's not terribly difficult compared to the M40 and the M41, but it's a lot more complicated than it needs to be. These two have loosened. These are the pumps for the valve body of the overdrive M41. I've just been cleaning everything, so you haven't missed much since the disassembly video, but now it's time to remove these. And also removing the solenoid, you have to get the special tool for it. It's just a 17 millimeter skinny wrench with a 90 degree attachment that is barely big enough to fit a half inch drive. You won't really mix these up, but I'm gonna pull them all out at once here. The middle one is the non-return valve. The one on the right is the filter, and the one on the left is the relief valve. Starting with the relief valve, as we remove this, there's an O-ring on it and a bunch of old oil. Yeah. Inside of there, looks like the relief valve came out. Oh my goodness, this thing is so gross inside. The relief valve is very tricky because it seems like that's all that comes out, but there's actually a lot more to it. And it is the big cylinder and then a small plate at the end, and typically those get forgotten, and that's... If I was just to replace these things, it's possible that the overdrive wouldn't work because I couldn't get the other O-rings changed. That's gonna be tricky, and this might be the hardest part of the removal because that whole cylinder in there is gonna be pretty stuck. Thankfully, it's the submerged in oil with O-rings kind of stuck, and it's not the rusted metal kind of stuck. I stuck the fat end of a plastic screwdriver handle in there and I'm able to spin it, so that's the first step in getting that loose. And for my next trick, I'm going to try to pull this out. Ah! There she is. There's a face only a mother could love. So let me show you. This is the big portion of the relief valve and there's one more piece in there so I can't relax the celebration now, but you do see. So PB Blaster really helps to remove the oil, and then when you put a towel in there, after you can get it spinning with something like a screwdriver, getting the towel in there allows me to kind of twist my finger and pull up, and that, that did it. The final piece is the little sombrero. I think that has two O-rings on it. She's coming. She's coming up slowly but surely. There we go. All right, that was a risky maneuver. Hey, right, come on. Okay. That's what I was trying to fish out. And you have access only from this side of it. Two O-rings, and unfortunately, the easiest way I could get to it like this was to put a tiny screwdriver into this hole, which is the relief a uh, pressure relief valve, spring, ball, and all that. And you don't want to damage the seat in there for the ball or else it won't seal anymore. And then up on the inside is what we're left with. Pretty, pretty cool. But I'm nervous that I may have damaged that a little bit. If you don't have the overdrive apart, you're just under the car, you can pull this access cover off. But getting something in there is a real pain. You would want something like, like a 90 degree pick but it needs to be half as long, so I'd have to cut it, and then you could hook it in there and start to pull down. I think tapping helps and getting it to spin helps. All these little things help, versus if it were just stuck and I was yanking on it. So that's all the components of the relief valve. Let's move on to the second valve, the pump valve. No, the filter. The biggest of the three, the largest of the three, is the filter. And I expect this to be right dirty in keeping with the rest of the trans. This tool is called a pin wrench, and I think these are four millimeters. Probably should have gone to four and a half if they had such a thing. Right, let's see the grossness. 
Gentle extraction, don't poke through your filter. Is there an upside downside? Let's see. No, I don't see anything marking up or down, so I'll just put a U for up. Well, it's not worse than I thought it would be, but it's right about there. What else is in the filter housing? That's it. It's just the filter, the cap, and an O-ring. No, it's not an O-ring. It's a copper washer. That's all going to get cleaned up pretty thoroughly, but I would like to get the third valve open right now. That would be really stellar. This is going to be a toughie. I hope the tool can handle it. Tool broke, and I'm pissed. All right, I drove the good pin out, and I put the broken one back in, in both halves. Here's hoping it works. They're a little shorter. Maybe they won't bend and break as much. Or it'll bend and break because they're not all the way in now. Ay ay ay. Get the expensive tools, guys. Don't do what I do and buy the cheap stuff. Ooh, and let there be dopamine, baby. Oh, I got this. All right, here's how it happened. Uh, the short pins actually did help tremendously because they don't flex as much, but there's still a risk of it breaking something somewhere else. And uh, I was prepared to start using things like other Allen keys just hammered through. But thankfully, with this clamp, very gently, but enough that it, it didn't cause this to fall out. It was, it was enough force and we got it and it's loose. And the important thing about keeping the tool intact, it's not that it just needs to survive removing these pieces. It needs to put them back on and tighten them down too. I won't give it a one star review on Amazon because it's certainly hefty enough elsewhere. And I do, I do read the reviews. I make sure that it's not the crappy, crappiest, cheapest one available. Because if I wanted that, I'd go to Harbor Freight and get theirs and not have to wait for shipping. And believe me, I've used them and they've broken from Harbor Freight before, so they just don't even fit well. Because they're all adjustable and they're meant for tools like angle grinders and swamp coolers. And anyway, let's get this off now. Boy, I tell you what, though, that feeling. I think hammering it is a bad idea. I think kind of like the Richter scale, you want to just sort of... Ease into it, ease into it, don't go kunk kunk break. Hmm. But it looks like this four millimeter by four millimeter, that's the way to go. The hammering that I was just doing was the pin that is here on the drive pump for the actual eccentric was coming out on the back side, and then that over here, you see it started to eat into the material. So the clearances are very tight, so I had to reset that kind of in the middle. Now this valve body is completely apart, minus the studs. I think all of the pieces inside have been removed. I'm gonna clean it, and then we can start reassembly with the O-rings. We'll do the valves first, then we'll move on to the pistons, then we'll do the clutch cone, and should have it all back together in, well, I don't know, hope an hour, that'd be great. Ooh, yo, yo, yo. Well, the reason I just installed this and then immediately pulled it back out is it went in a little rough and I don't like that. I want it to go in smoothly. So I think I'm gonna take some steel wool to it, try to clean up all the edges and then I'll reinstall the O-rings and also clean the chamber. I might've gotten some scuffs or scratches in there that could interfere with the operation of this pump valve. This is, um, you know, it's called the relief valve and it won't do much good if it can't engage and disengage to actually relieve pressure. This is the part where having some finesse comes into play. I had to remove this valve a third time because when I put the relief valve spring in there, it was jamming and it 
got stuck about that far and wouldn't go in any further. And it's still getting a little stucky here, but it seems to be better on one side. So here's my solution. I take a file, I take the valve, and I spin it. And I spin it until it's free. And once it starts moving nicely, that means all the burrs inside from the tools that I use to extract it are gone. Forgot to install the springs. What I spent the last hour hammering was getting the studs to try to get back up into the normal position. So if we look here at this diagram, where the cone clutch is, there's four studs with the four springs, and each of those studs is just hammered into the aluminum base plate where the large bearing goes. And unfortunately, two of them fell out of the studs. And what that meant for me, you can only see one in there, but it was the one that was the most uh, at fault you see the spring, and then at the bottom of the spring is the stud. And then from the stud, there's a little bit of a gap. The others, they don't have any gap, but these two did. And the best thing I could hope to do was just wedge it up so that it kept going up and up and up. Now the whole point of that assembly is when the pressure from the pump is engaged, this, these pistons push these out and then the cone engages. And unfortunately, it looks like we're gonna have either lopsided engagement or it won't matter at all because the pressure will sort of equilibrate to the point that they're still just gonna have even engagement and then it won't be any issue. So um, if it is gonna be an issue, we'll find out when we overdrive is engaged. If it's not an issue, we gotta move on. The solution to that would just be to tear it all apart and get back to those studs. And now would be the time to do it, but I, I'm, I don't think that's gonna be much of an issue. I hope I don't eat my words later because that would just be too bad. I'm also hoping that just over time in drive cycles, you know, because the force of the springs are there and the heat, the expansion of the two metals, eventually it'll settle into a spot. Uh, it doesn't look like an exact thing. If it was an exact thing, it would have something like a lock washer or it would be bolted on. It just gets hammered in. So I don't know.
My phone's overheating, so this is the look that you'll get at it. I'm gonna start putting everything back together. Should be pretty straightforward. And the important thing is that the center is clean, clear, and importantly, spins freely. Quite a reddish sunset tonight because there's a lot of smoke blowing in from some sort of forest fire way out there. This clean break though, so dramatic. Oh, I always use this as my opportunity to kind of stretch my shoulders out for a few minutes and appreciate the sunset. Transmission rebuild's almost finished. It's important to note that the overdrive solenoid should have a valve that moves freely. That's an easy way to check it in here. I can kind of wiggle it with my tool. And you see the bottom hole, how it's moving up and down? I'm pushing against the spring that's in the inside of the valve. All of that. Now, the other thing to note, the polarity is not directional. So I could wire positive and negative either way. I've got my lead here for the negative wire. And I have new O-rings on it, the two. I just need a copper washer from my reseal kit. And then we'll thread it back in using this fancy wrench and get it all in. That's it, I've got to put in this piece. And from what I was reading from the rebuild, they were saying that these two bolts here, uh, it just, if it starts to spin, like I had an issue with it, put a screwdriver in there to try to pry them up, but there's nothing that says it needs to be seated all the way, at least not from the Triumph rebuilds. J-Type Overdrive Rebuild page, which has been very, very useful. And then I can mate this to the gearbox, but I'd like to put the bell housing on first. There it is, because I want to make sure that my counter shaft end play is within specification per the book. part where it gets a little stupid. I have attached the front bell housing and now I'm working on the counter shaft and here's the specification for it as we discussed a minute ago. Now, with my straight edge in place, the counter shaft is hammered all the way forward and it looks like it sits, it's like a millimeter high. Hammer it more, I guess. I mean, that's what they say, right? Well, the measurement is actually not the shaft, but it's the bearing itself. And I'm gonna make sure everything's still good here. Feels okay. Now, I've only got two shims, and I think I'm gonna use them both here to get the counter shaft end play to be at zero. Let's see if they do that. Between the two of them, I think it's a half a millimeter or something. Well, how about that? Huh, I can actually tell very well here. With both of these in place, it is it feels perfectly flush. We want zero to 0 0.002 inches or 0 0.05 millimeters. That feels great. Okay, so we're gonna reuse the shims and it puts us right there within spec. According to my silly eyes. Anti-clockwise. 
It has, in fact, yeah, it's about 50% overlap, so there's not a chance that's going to work. There. There it goes. It is that simple. Okay, I granted I've been doing this for a while, um, but if you find that it's sitting again, just a little bit proud of this, the studs are sitting just a little bit proud of the bottom flange, then all that's happened is the bottom set of splines have rotated again, off it comes on the bench, rotate those bottom set of splines counterclockwise, anti-clockwise again, and try again. Just not having good luck today. just before being in line because of course once you get it on there it will still try and rotate itself anti-clockwise and get into line This is the end of the two-day journey to get this transmission put back together. It is so, like I said, so much more complicated than it needs to be. The M40 and the M41, yes, they're four-cylinder transmissions. And yes, this was also used on a four-cylinder version of the P1800 or the 1800ES and the E's in the later years. But why does it have to be this hefty? Um, for the six-cylinder, I guess it makes sense, but the, the big difference between this and the smaller transmissions is the bell housing is part of the integral gearbox total thing. It's not like you can just leave this on the car with the clutch and then just bloop, pop it all out from the four bolts. You have to remove the bell housing to get the trans out, and that adds complexity to other things. I like the mechanical shift fork. I think that's great. Going to be probably trouble-free for many, many years. The four bolts uh, on the ring here. The smaller transmission in the early cars have a three bolt ring and those bolts have their own O-rings. So you do wanna make sure you seal them nice and tight with new O-rings as well as using Loctite because uh, front main seal leaks are possible and actually you've had to pull transmissions back out because I didn't use Loctite on those. Yeah, this plastic right here is so brittle that I even just trying to adjust this thing, I accidentally grabbed it in the rear and it broke and from there i have to remember not to touch that at all but i do need to zip tie it in two places so that it is safely secured to the back of the trans it's mostly a dust shield that's all it does frankly a lot of them are gone because they are so brittle after all these years um, but it will help prevent things from splashing up in there especially stuff right here um, if, if you have to make something, maybe just stretch some plastic out and poke a couple holes in it. Something rudimentary, really, but the assembly here has been lubed up really nicely. As you saw, it took many hours getting lube and grease, black grease, green grease, all the fancy greases in all the places. These are lock washers here, so hammer those shut. Nice and tight on all the bolts. Nice and tight on all the bolts. Brand new gaskets, but a used solenoid. This is all the stuff that I changed. There it is for the world to see. I'm proud of my work, but boy, did that take way too long from what I wanted it to. Not thrilled, but it's fine. We're moving on. Tomorrow, my goal is to mate the engine. Wow, English. Mate the engine and the transmission. Get them in the car. That's going to be huge because I think a big part of my day is going to be spent fiddling with the manifold. I have two manifolds. One of them is gonna be better than the other, and I wanna make sure that I put the carburetors on that one. In addition to that, 
I have to check things on the carbs, inspect some of the seals. I want to make sure that everything is in good running, working order because I don't want to lean out my brand new engine. And for that very reason, I bought this O2 sensor bung. This is a saddle style, looks like a cute little hat, and it will fit on the pipe 18 inches away from the manifold minimum for my O2 wideband sensor. I'm gonna be monitoring my air fuel ratio because I need to know how she's doing. Thank you for watching. I know that this was a long video for getting the transmission put back together, but boy, oh boy, take pictures when you're taking stuff apart. You can't have too many photos, to be honest, every step of the way. And then having a manual really helps because the, the books are very useful for a lot of the tips and tricks, including the specifications. Okay, that's it. Good night. See you in the next episode as we mount our engine and get one step closer to this car running and driving.